Well, if you have your Bible, Luke chapter 21, and uh, I title the message, The Invisible Hand of a Sovereign God. As I get older and I reflect on history and, and I reflect on the world that we live in today, I become more and more confident that history is truly his story, it is the story of the sovereign hand of God. And though we look at the world that we live in and there's much about it that uh, seems right now to be in turmoil, uh, to realize that our God is not uh, taken blindsided by the events of our world or even the events of your life. And so as we turn in our Bible to Luke chapter 21, we will find ourselves uh, in the midst of the week that will end with the cross. I do invite you, if you've not uh, been a part, a part of the Shepherd Daily Devotions, uh, this next week will actually be uh, on the way to the cross. We'll uh, highlight the betrayal, which I believe was in today's devotion, and we will follow all the way to the cross and then the victorious resurrection that will follow that. And so we certainly appreciate you being here with us today. And let's look to the Lord and let's pray. Our Father, we bow before you with a, a true heart of thanksgiving, uh, being reminded today of uh, all the things that have gone on even before this message, uh, songs of praise and worship, uh, opportunities of, of Sunday school classes opening your word in, and each teacher having the uh, holy duty, the responsibility of declaring your truth. And so, Lord, we come now to uh, this moment that we open your word to study and to worship, uh, to be challenged, to learn. Uh, Father, that we might uh, be, as we'll see, challenged in the word today, not be terrified or be afraid of the unfolding of events in our world. Uh, we find ourselves living in a, a time of uncertainty uh, perhaps for many a time of fear, uh, wondering what the future might hold, uh, whether or not we'll be involved with a great conflict and sons and, and daughters have to go to war, uh, whether or not there will be a, another attack within our own United States uh, and are the enemies among us. Uh, Lord, so many things that could uh, cause us to uh, tremble. And yet, we're reminded today, even as we open your word and study, that these perilous times were forecast. They were foretold. Uh, we are challenged by the word today that for in such an hour that the time of tribulation will begin and that the second coming of our Savior will follow. And so, Lord, as we open your word now, I pray that you will find our hearts attentive. I pray that you would bless this preacher with uh, a, a tongue to speak truth. And, Lord, that we might be able to declare uh, unapologetically, thus saith the Lord. So, Lord, thank you for the time that we have to share and for these that have come to share it with us. We ask all this in Christ's name. Amen. I hope that you have the outline that was available as you came in this morning. And we're going to really just dive into where we are in the scripture. We have been studying chronologically through the Gospels for the last several weeks. And as we come to Luke chapter 21, the day is the Wednesday before the cross. In fact, as you have your Bible there, Luke chapter 21, verses 1 through 4, the Lord has been teaching in the temple that morning. And that's where he made the observation as rich men came and they cast in their silver and their gold into the treasury of the temple. And he had watched as a widow cast in two mites, two, two little pennies worth, as she cast it in. And the Lord had made the observation that she has cast in more than they all well, we understand she cast in out of her want. The wealthy men were casting in out of their abundance. 
But with that comment, as we come to verse 5, we find that the Lord now is beginning to leave. In fact, as we come to verse 5 and verse 6, He is already making His way out of the city of Jerusalem. He is ascending the Mount of Olives, which overlooks Jerusalem. And in fact, I've been there. From the Mount of Olives, you can look out and see the peak of the Temple Mount itself. And so as the Lord arrives in that place, he has picked up a conversation along the way. And it was a conversation about the temple. And it was a prophecy that the temple would be destroyed. We read in Luke 21 in verse 6 then these words. As for these things which ye behold, the days will come in the which there shall not be left one stone Upon another, one stone of the temple will be all broken down that shall not be thrown down. Now, we know that happened in 70 AD. Rome, as they uh, uh, conquered the city of Jerusalem, ascended the Temple Mount. And they literally began to dismantle the stones of the temple because there was gold within the temple on the walls itself. And so in order to retrieve all the gold and the silver and other precious items that were there, they literally tore the temple down stone by stone. Well, you could imagine for the disciples, this shocked them. This temple that is built to worship the Lord, the, the God of heaven. And the Lord is now saying that what you look upon is that which will be absolutely destroyed. That takes us to another thought. In Luke 21, in verse 7 the disciples now at the Lord before them sit, and they began to ask questions about the temple. We read in Luke 21 and verse 7, Master, or that is teacher, but when? When shall these things be? This dismantling, the destruction of the temple. And what sign will there be when these things shall come to pass? Another verse in Matthew 24 and verse 13, we read also, What shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? And so the subject of our study today is to answer that question. Follow with me on your outline, and I would invite you to notice, first of all, that Luke's gospel in chapter 21 records five prophetic signs that precede the tribulation and Christ's second coming. We have, as a body of believers for 2,000 years, been watching and waiting. The Lord promised His disciples on the night that He was betrayed, in John chapter 14, that He was going away, but He also promised, and I'll come again. And so the waiting of believers has been for two millennia, when is He coming? And the answer to that is given not by date, but is given to us by signs. So I'm going to briefly in our message this morning, share with you five signs that precede the second coming of Jesus Christ. Some of those signs will carry through the tribulation period. But I invite you to follow with me. First of all, in Luke chapter 21 and verse 8, the first sign is that of what I'm calling religious charlatans or religious hypocrites. I, you probably do not follow like I do, but quote church news. Uh, there's a magazine called Christianity Today. And I've been watching with sorrow, but not with surprise, that across our nation, really in the last year, pastors of some of the mega churches, the major churches, some of the great leaders in America have fallen morally. Uh, disbanded, put out of the ministry, bringing great shame upon the ministry and upon their congregations. In fact, some of those churches that they had pastored under this uh, 
I guess I, what I'm going to say, the showmanship of a preacher have collapsed, gone into bankruptcy, and shut their doors. But this should be expected. As you read in Luke chapter 21 and verse 8, the prophecy of the Lord is that there would be some coming in His name. Let's read what it says. Luke 21 and verse 8, Take heed that ye be not deceived or led astray. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ. Now you'll notice in your Bibles the word Christ is in italics. So it could simply read this, shall come in my name, saying, I am. And the time draweth near, go ye not therefore after them. So notice in the verse there, uh, two thoughts or two commands or two warnings. The first is one, be not dis or take heed, that is, be on your guard. Number two, be not deceived, be not led astray. Many will come in Christ's name. Now here's a question for you. As I stand and I open my Bible and teach this morning, how can you know whether I'm a charlatan or I'm the real McCoy? How can you know? What, what is the test of it? You like me, you don't like me. He's popular, he's not popular. But those are not the tests. The test of whether or not a man that stands in a pulpit and preaches his teaching is true is what? It's the Word of God. And so you judge a man not by his talent, his eloquence, or, or by his personality, but the man that stands and teaches ought to be judged by the Word of God. And so as you look at the verse here, take heed. That is, be on your guard. Have your antenna spiritually, have it up. And be not deceived. Don't be easily led astray. Why? Because there's going to come many that will say, I am. Now they might say, I am the Messiah. There has always been men that would arise in this world that would say, I'm the Christ. And they would lead a great following, but for only a season. And then they would falter and they would fail. And so Christ tells his disciples to make sure when the fake Christ come, or the ones coming, they say they're coming in my name, don't be deceived and go ye not therefore after them. I challenge you this morning. Don't make my personality or anybody else's personality what you follow. A man is not worthy of your worship, only God alone. Now, let me give you the second. The second sign of the tribulation being at hand and the second coming of Christ that would follow is a time of international unrest. Would you agree with me this morning that we look at the news and all over the world, it seems like the whole world is ready to explode? Right? Trouble in Russia, trouble in the Ukraine, trouble with China, China threatening the U.S., uh, the U.S. seeking to try to go to, a, it seems like we're trying to go to war with everybody. Trouble in the Middle East. We have wars and wars and wars all over this world like I have not ever seen in my lifetime. Here's what the Bible says in Luke 21 and verse 9. One of the signs, and we read, But when ye shall hear of wars and commotions. Now the word commotions is the word for insurrections. All right? So when you shall hear of wars and commotions or insurrections, be not terrified. Let me pause there. The word terrify is what? Don't be frightened. Don't be afraid. Now here's what we can do. If you're like a, a consumer of uh, CNN or, or MSNBC or Fox News, and, and I go into homes and I visit, especially with older people, and they often have their, their uh, television on and they're watching the news. Talk about a major reason for depression. The news is nothing but bad news. It's like there's never anything good, right? I, I wonder, though, 
Is it, is it feeding our appetite for bad? Or is it that they just totally ignore anything good that might be happening? Well, in this world, as the end of the days draws close, there's going to be bad news. There's going to be wars and there will be rumors of wars, commotions. And yet the command is what? Be not af afraid or terrified. Now let me keep reading. But when you shall hear of wars and commotions, be not terrified, for these things must first come to pass. But the end is not by and by. That is, it's not yet done. So, looking at the news, going home today, and, you know, we're here to, hearing the rattling of sabers and the threat of nuclear uh, missiles, and, and China's got a missile, and it can hit the U.S., and the U.S. has got a missile, and we can hit China, and then we have uh, weapons of war over in uh, Europe, and we can hit Russia, and we have all this craziness going on in the world. And then the fact that Iraq might have an atomic weapon, and, and boy, it, we're, we're just on the brink of nuclear disaster and God says be not terrified in fact what you are observing are the things that must come to pass these are things that must happen and yet we're told but the end is not by and by uh, I'll give a for instance. Let's say I, I, Iran, I said Iraq earlier, Iran gets a nuclear weapon, right? We've been on the edge for 20 years. Iran's going to get the nuclear weapon. And believe me, I don't want them to get a nuclear weapon. They want to kill everybody. But I can assure you, they're not going to send a nuclear weapon into Israel. Because they look at Jerusalem as the holy city. And so we can... Breathe a sigh of relief because even at the second coming of Christ, Jerusalem will be inhabited. And there will be people there under siege as a result of the hatred for the Jewish people. And so breathe a sigh of relief. Now, I can't say we're not going to get shot, but I can assure you that Israel is going to be there. Israel is not going to be removed again. Even though there's a great war and hatred for that nation. And then look at verse 10. Then said he, that is Jesus, unto them. Nation shall rise against nation. And kingdom against kingdom. Now, that has always been the case. This is nothing new. The newness in all of this is the weapons of mass destruction that we possess today. We can literally obliterate a city, as happened with Hiroshima. We can eliminate a province. We could destroy a state. And we might even be able to destroy a nation with the power of nuclear weapons. And yet for you and I as believers, if we are numbered among the terrified ones, we will hardly give people confidence that our God is sovereign. Let me take you a step further then. As you look at this, I wanted to give you some verses that go along with this nation rising against nation. Okay, so the first is this. That Jesus counseled his father, followers, be not terrified. And then the second, in the book of Revelation, and you might want to turn there. In the book of Revelation, it foretells that peace will be taken from the earth. During the tribulation and before the second coming of Christ. And so as we look at this international turmoil, it is a precursor of that which Christ said would come.
Look at Romans 6 and verse 4, for instance. And there we read, And there went out another horse that was shed. Now this is in the tribulation period. And power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth. That they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. In Romans chapter 16, beginning in verse 16, we read, And he, that is the Antichrist, gathered them together into a place and called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. And the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air. And there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying, It is done. And there were voices and thunders and lightnings. And there was a great earthquake, such as was not since men were upon the earth. So mighty an earthquake and so great. And so before the second coming of Christ, there will be a time and a season of international unrest. Here's a third one. There will also be international disasters and disease. We read in Luke 21, verse 11, these words, And great earthquakes shall be in divers or various places, and famines and pestilences, and fearful sights and great sights, uh, signs there shall be from heaven. Let me deal with the earthquake for a beginning. The United States Geological Society as of this time in September 2024, has recorded this year alone 9,789 earthquakes around the earth. Earthquakes this year have been reported in Texas, California, New Jersey, Hawaii, Oklahoma, and Utah. Earthquakes internationally, Russia, China, Japan, Taiwan, Philippines, Peru, El Salvador, and Venezuela. And so we're told that earthquakes will be in divers or many places. And then notice also famines and pestilences. If you follow the news at all, you are aware that there is a growing concern of our food supply, not only as a nation, but food supply internationally. For instance, the Ukraine, where all the wars and, and battles between Russia and, and the Ukraine are taking place, and heaven, heaven only knows how much we have already placed there. But understand that the Ukraine is the breadbasket of all of Europe. It is the richest land in Europe. Europe is dependent upon the grain that grows and comes out of the Ukraine. But we have, in effect, because of this war, have shut down not only the oil supply, but we've also now facing the fact that we may face in another year of famine of international proportions. Do you know that here in these United States, for instance, are you aware that China... Communist China has purchased tens of thousands of acres of farmland. Are you aware of that? For instance, when my wife and I were visiting along the coast of North Carolina, we're passing acres and acres and acres of, of soybean that's growing there. And I learned while I was there that China has purchased some of the major farms that are in that area. They have done the same out west. Now, Governor DeSantis, I believe, has outlawed China purchasing land here. But China has purchased also great uh, ranch land in our own nation. They are taking our debt and our dollars, and they are purchasing our land as a result. Also, you have wealthy people like Bill Gates. I think Bill Gates is the largest private landowner in the United States. And he is opposed to raising beef and cattle. So what we're looking at is the potential of a limitation on our own food supply. Also, I believe, is it three out of four meat packers of the United States are owned by communist China. 
Now, we don't have to be geniuses to think, I wonder who they're going to feed first, us or themselves? And so this matter of famine is very real. Also, the fact of the climate change, right? All this concern about climate. If you drive across America today, you'll see huge swaths of farmland with solar panels on them. No longer are they raising food on the farmland. Now they have solar panels. If you go further, if you go out west, you're going to find windmills that have taken up huge swaths of acreage that used to be ranch land. So we are contributing ultimately to our own demise and I believe setting the stage for great hunger. But then we come to pestilences. Uh, pestilences, uh, I might give a word that you're familiar with. How about pandemic? Pandemic. We are, as a nation, our government has been funding research internationally and here at home, taking normal viruses and genetically modifying them in such a way that they are able to weaponize those and kill millions and millions of people. Add another thought to that. Recent immigration around the world, not only here in the United States through our southern border, where I hear anywhere from 15 to 20 million uh, illegal immigrants have come into the States, but the same movement has also happened in Europe. There are capital cities such as London are now, the English are now in the minority. And what they're bringing with them, with that movement, are diseases that at one time we thought were dead. Science had conquered, medic, medical uh, prescriptions had finally won the day. Well, let me uh, say, share this with you. Currently, Growing in our nation and around the world is an epidemic of measles, tuberculosis, scarlet fever, polio, leprosy, syphilis, and the bubonic plague. If you follow the news every once in a while, you'll hear in these United States that these diseases that were once eliminated are suddenly now making a comeback. And so we look at the end of time, it's going to be marked by uh, earthquakes, it's going to be marked by famines and pestilences. But then that brings us to another, number four of the five we're looking at today. The fourth sign that points to the uh, time of the tribulation and the second coming of Christ would be a time of fearful sights and great sights in the heaven. We read in Luke 21... Verse 11, and fearful sights and great sights shall there be from heaven. Let me give you some thoughts with that. Here's the first one. Christ did not specify, did not detail, did not illustrate for us what the fearful sights would be. Simply, there will be terrifying sights that will behold. Now, there are many things that might terrify us. Some of what I've already shared today could terrify us, but other things that could. We live in Florida. We keep hearing that the hurricanes are growing stronger and stronger. Uh, we've seen uh, tornadoes that go across the, the Midwest and the huge swaths of destruction that they leave in their path. We hear that uh, in uh, Yellowstone, that there's the possibility ultimately of a volcano that might explode and wreak havoc on the West. And so there are many things that are things that could be terrifying. Let me give you some verses to go with this. In Revelation chapter 8 and verse 7, we read that the first angels sounded and there followed hail and fire mingled with blood. When you think about fire, and we have firemen here, I know uh, uh, Jim Bates was a fireman, Josh Dargoats is a fireman. I don't know if uh, Cody Green is here this morning, he's a fireman. I don't know about you, but fire terrifies me because I know 
its destruction. I know how the winds can feed the fire. I'll give you an illustration. Do you remember the fire in Hawaii? Do you remember that? How explosive it was. The fires in California, a lot of it because of the green ideals. And that they're not clearing the land. They're not removing uh, the fallen wood that has died. And as a result, we have this incendiary uh, fire wood that is everywhere waiting to explode. Well, here's what we read. Revelation 8 and verse 7. The first angel sounded, and there followed a hail and fire mingled with blood, and they were cast upon the earth. And the third part of the trees was burnt up, and all green grass was burnt up. So this is the tribulation. This is the expectation of things before the second coming of Christ. We also read in verse 8 of these words, And the second angel sounded, and as it were a great mountain burning with fire, was cast into the sea, might be describing a volcano, volcanic action. And the third part of the sea became blood, killing uh, much, many of the sea creatures, a third of them. And then we read in verse 9, uh, And the third part of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died, and the third part of the ships were destroyed. So there you're seeing this uh, commercial ships destroyed and we know how much we depend upon shipping in our world today add another part to that not only fearful sights but also great signs from heaven now i know that we are uh, able to today with modern telescopes in space we're able to look into space and to see not only the beauty of god's creation but to see that we can see no end to the universe that God has created. But in the end of times, before the second coming of Christ, there is to be great signs from heaven. Let me give you a, a couple of illustrations of those. In Revelation chapter 8 and verse 10, we read these words, And the third angel sounded, and there fell a great star from heaven, burning as it were a lamp, and it fell upon the third part of the rivers and upon the fountains of water. Listen, one of the concerns of modern times has been asteroids, right? We, we, we know that there have been times that the earth was hit by meteors. In fact, many think that that is what brought in the Ice Age. But there is also the understanding that there has been a growing concern of the asteroids. And if one of those asteroids makes a huge impact, what might it do to the earth? And so NASA and others are developing these missiles and, and trying to figure out, well, as an asteroid become close, we'll shoot that missile into, state, uh, into space. And if we can hit it, then we'll just move it enough to not hit the earth. But here's what the prophecy says. The prophecy says, and there fell a great star from heaven, burning as it were a lamp, and it fell upon the third part of the rivers and upon the fountains of water. And so we're looking at the waters themselves being destroyed, fresh water particularly. And then fourthly, four of five, here's the, uh, the well, actually the fifth one. There will also be a time of religious persecution. Now, here's what we read in Luke 12 and verse 21. And I believe, as with many prophecies, there was the immediate and then there is the far-reaching application, or we could even say the implication. So in Revelation chapter, or rather Luke chapter 21 and verse 12, the Lord tells his disciples there is a time a persecution that is coming. Here's what the Bible says. But before all these, the wars, the rumors of wars, the nations rising against nation, before all these, they shall lay hands on you. Now, let's pause there. Who is he talking to? He's talking to the disciples. The disciples have been arguing throughout their three and a half years with Christ. Who shall be the greatest? 
They will, on the very night that he is betrayed, argue on the way to the uh, Garden of Gethsemane. They'll be arguing which of us should be the greatest. And so what the Lord is telling them goes counter to everything that they want to believe. They want to believe that Christ is going to rule and reign at that time. And so the idea of persecution runs contrary to anything that they had imagined. And so we read in Luke 21 and verse 12 this description. But before or prior to all these things we read about in verses 10 and 11, they shall lay their hands on you, his disciples, his followers, and they shall persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and into prisons, being brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. Now, let me just sum up in just a few moments here. Notice in the passage the word synagogues. Now, synagogues was a place of worship, but it was for the Jewish people a place where court was held. Civilian and religious cases were tried in the synagogues. There were local men who were appointed to pass judgment in those synagogues. Now what the disciples are being told, the time pointing to the time of the end is a time of persecution. Of those that were listening to the Lord teach that day, they would be flogged and humiliated. Peter and John would be imprisoned for preaching in Christ's name. Stephen, one of the first deacons, would be stoned. James, the brother of John, would be put to death. And Paul would become a persecutor and then the persecuted. And then the latter part, before kings and rulers for my name's sake. In A.D. 64, Nero, the emperor of Rome, set that city aflame. And because of the anger of the people, he blamed it on the Christians. And what followed would be three centuries of persecution of God's people. Only did it end in 324 B.C. when Constantine became emperor of Rome. Another thought, just for your outline as we get to a close. Persecution, rather than deter or destroy faith in Christ, actually fueled the spread of the gospel. Let me say this to you this morning. When the church has been persecuted, it has always been not only purified, but it has emerged more powerful in its testimony. So what is God's plan for us? Is it possible that as we look at the political climate of our society today, that before the coming of Christ, maybe even before the tribulation, that God has already begun the process that will purge the church, that we might be more purified. Let's look at some verses quickly. Luke 21 and verse 13 through 15. And it shall turn to you for a testimony, this persecution. And then he says, settle it therefore in your hearts, not to meditate before what ye shall answer. When they take you in front of the synagogues, when they take you uh, to be tried, when they take you before the kings and the judges, don't worry about what you will say. Why? Verse 15. Well, verse 15 again. For I will give you a mouth and wisdom, which all of your adversaries shall not be able to gainsay nor resist. The word gainsay is to contradict or refute. Here's a challenge for you and I as believers to live in such a way that our testimony for Christ speaks for itself. I believe that we are as a society facing a great war morally and spiritually. 
And we have to determine as individual believers, am I willing to be faithful? Even if trouble, even if persecution comes. Thirdly, Christ also foretold that persecution would arise from one's family and friends. I learned some interesting lessons watching COVID, our nation, and watching how if we were not careful as believers, there was the mask and the unmask. Something as simple as wearing a mask or not wearing a mask. And then it went from there to vaxxed versus the unvaxxed. And you know that families were being divided over something that simple? Our nation was being divided. There was a fueling of division over something as simple as vax and unvax. And I'll make one comment. We have been told for, what, 50 years, you can't tell me what to do with my body by the abortion gang, remember? And all of a sudden, they could tell you what to do with your body. Our culture is sadly depraved. And it will not take much for families and loved ones to turn on one another. Especially culturally. I'm watching with great interest the Democrat versus Republican. I'm fascinated by it. Regardless of the outcome. That we are as a nation literally divided down the middle. And I'm expecting violence. Are you not? Let's read what the Bible says here about believers though. Luke 21 and verse 16 and 17. And ye shall be betrayed for your testimony's sake by both parents and brethren and kinsfolk and friends. And some of you shall they cause to be put to death. And ye shall be hated of all men, Christ says, for my sake. So what's the future? The future is going to be one. Not of vax and unvax and mask and unmask. Democrat versus Republican. The battle is far greater than that. It's going to be between biblicists, Bible believers, and the unbelievers. The unbelievers are going to become emboldened in their wickedness. And for those that choose to live godly, righteous lives, all of a sudden, we will find ourselves the ones wearing the target. The abortion issue is a divisive issue. The sexual morality issue is a divisive issue. The transsexual issue is a divisive issue. For you and me who are Bible believers, we only have one place to stand, and that's where the Bible stands. We believe that all life is sacred. And therefore, the taking of life appalls us. And yet that's counter to much of the culture. We believe that God in the beginning created he them male and female. But we're looking at a political agenda that is opposed to that, vehemently opposed to that. And so again, we're not divided just along cultural lines. We're divided along lines of Bible believers versus unbelievers. We even have churches today that reject God's truth. I close. Here we go. Though persecuted, Jesus assured his disciples their souls were secure. Let's read this. Luke 21 and verse 18 and 19. And we read, but there shall not a hair of your head perish. Now, I realize some of you have already had that problem already, okay? But this is not talking about the hair of your head. 
is talking about how much God cherishes you. As a believer, facing a time of persecution, a time of violence, maybe a time of trouble, the promise of the word is this in verse 18, there shall not a hair of your head perish, in your patience possess ye your souls. The word patience there is to endure. And so here's our challenge. As a Bible believer, am I willing to stand on God's word? Am I willing to identify with Jesus Christ when all the rest of the world marches against him? Am I willing to entrust the caring of my soul and salvation to Christ? And let me close then with some thoughts here. The siege of Jerusalem, I'm not going to teach it, but it is mentioned in verses 20 through 24. The first siege did occur in AD 70. There will be another, well, that was the second siege, but th there is another future. And we'll study it in the book of Revelation, leading to the Battle of Armageddon. So I, I would say stay tuned, we'll be there, okay? And then I want to close with this thought. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 7, we read, for the mystery of iniquity, literally lawlessness, doth already work. Only he who now letteth or restrains will restrain. Until he, the Holy Spirit, be taken out of the way. Now, I'm not going to discuss the rapture this morning versus the mid-trib and all of this that we can easily get involved with. But I want you to know as I close this morning that I believe that it's the presence of the Holy Spirit in this world that is restraining lawlessness right now. But we do know that the Bible teaches as the time of the second coming draws nigh. That the earth itself will be as it is in turmoil. There will be an increase of it. And so as Paul is writing in 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 7, he's saying already in the world there was a spirit of lawlessness. That lawlessness has continued in the recent years in a rapid increase. Do you realize that we cannot look to our government not to be lawless. We cannot look to our courts to be just. We are witnessing the turning upside down of that which is good has become evil and that which is evil has become good. And so this spirit of lawlessness is in our world and yet this must be. It must come to pass. I believe that the Holy Spirit and the presence of the church in this world is restraining the wicked. But there is a day, and I believe this, you can be contrary to it. I believe that there is a day appointed, and it may be soon, that the believers are going to be taken up out of this world. I believe that the Holy Spirit will be removed and I believe that the lawlessness and wickedness will abound. You say, well, I have a different opinion. Well, in eternity, we'll all have our theology straightened out, won't we? I can accept that. I, for one, am waiting, but I'm occupying. Here's what I want to close with. And it is the fact that I believe we're living in the last days. I believe that with all my heart. I believe that evil men are, as this Paul wrote, are waxing worse and worse. I also believe that as you look at the scriptures, and I won't have time to teach it, I might teach it on Wednesday, but I think that we're watching the hatred of, of, of the Jews and of Israel growing like we've not seen in our lifetime. And the hatred 
of those people is ever increasing. I need to close. I'm going to close with this. I believe we're living in the last days. And I believe that they are perilous times. I wish I had time to close and to finish it. I don't. So here's what I'm going to close with. I'm going to close with Christ's words. He told his disciples on Luke chapter 12, or 21 rather, he said, be not terrified. For this must be. So here's a thought for you. Do you believe that God is sovereign? If we believe that God is sovereign, then we trust Him. Not the circumstances, the things happening all around us. We have to come to a point that we rest in Him. God has not abdicated His throne. And He says, I have secured you. Not even the hairs of your head, a metaphor, will perish. Some believer this morning, trust the Lord. Don't let the bad news despair your heart. When you hear the bad news, just be reminded, he said, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Maybe you're here this morning. And you do not know Jesus Christ as Savior. Then be afraid. The hour and the opportunity. Of turning from your sin. And trusting Christ. Is now. Don't let this moment pass. He that has foretold all the things that would come to pass. Is the same one. Who died for your sins on the cross. Was buried. And raised from the dead. He died for you. That you might be saved. Won't you trust him.